work. You gotta be kidding. Hello and welcome to the Canadian Antiques Roadshow from Kingston, Ontario. Kingston is proud of its heritage. Its beautiful 19th century architecture has earned it the title of Canada's Limestone City. It's really a university town and has close to 25,000 students enrolled in post-secondary programs. The Royal Military College and of course Queen's University dominate campus life in this city of 140,000. Grant Hall is a beautiful building. It's the centerpiece of Queen's University and home today to the Canadian Antiques Roadshow. And the people of Kingston look like they've brought some really interesting things. I see it belongs to the university. Yes, it is. Um, so where do you keep it? We keep it in the Phys Ed Center. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our major athletic trophy, which we present annually to our major graduating athletes, uh, both scholastically and athletics. It's about uh, 250 ounces. Wow. Now that's uh, Troy. Troy, Troy ounces. ounces. Heavier ounces, a little right. bit. Um, and a uh, full, I don't know whether or not you, uh, you'd have to be a member of the <laughs> athletics department, I think, to pick it up at all I if it were full. I would say. Um, and given to you by a certain Mr. Jenkins. That's correct. Can you tell us about Mr. Jenkins? Well, we really don't know a great deal about uh, Thomas Jenkins, other than uh, he was asked to uh, rebuild our facilities, our athletic facilities, and uh, he was so impressed with, uh, with the gymnasium and its building that he donated this to put into the Athletic Board of Control room. So it's um, pure silver, pure sterling, silver, right? sterling. Made in Sheffield, Sheffield right. yes, uh, for a London maker, right. uh, a, a London retailer, I should right. say, uh, in 1896. 1896. Yes, okay. I can't, I, I can't tell you the the, the name of the of the maker, right. because the uh, silver mark struck on this, yes. which is here, right. Um, is not recorded, oh, is. Uh, as far as I can see, I see. Uh, and appears to be the initial of the maker, um, of the, not the maker, but the retailer underneath. But it is so, uh, so much a piece of late 19th century silversmithing, and with carroted handles like this, uh, people with wings, punched out from the inside in oh, see, repoussé right. work, chased all over, beautifully done, on a nice round flint, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's just an excellent piece of work. Well, uh, there are various ways of looking at its value, but the workmanship is such a high quality. Yes. Looks like Elkington's work to me, but I'm guessing at that. Okay. I think it's Elkington. Okay. Uh, it would be, oh, well, uh, a very large factor to one. I can see that this would be $30,000 to replace, at the very least, uh, if you could get anybody to make it right. these days. Isn't this the coolest thing? Look, Tim Borden's autograph, Timmy Ho himself. And he autographed this for you? Yes, he did. My mom went in and got all the signatures back in when well, I was 12 years old. So when, when are these sticks autographed by the Maple Leafs? It was, yes, uh, it was between 64 and 67. Wow. Stanley yeah. Cup winners they were back then. Yes, that's right. Well, how did you, how did your mom get access to the Maple Leafs? Well, she worked at the Tamashana where they used to practice. And so she got these sticks signed for you. Yeah. And you've got, you got a goalie stick there too. Yeah, signed by Johnny Barrett. Oh, isn't that fabulous? And I also have a picture of him too, signing it. So you've kept these all these years? Yes. Did they evaluate them for you? Yes. What did they tell you? A thousand dollars for the goal stick and Four hundred dollars each for these. That is fantastic. Very exciting. Well, I have to admit, I hate bugs, but I love Art Nouveau jewelry, and this is exactly what we have here—a beautiful example of Art Nouveau jewelry. Um, where did you find it? It was left uh, in my mother-in-law's estate. It's a real bug, and um, just to explain a little bit about Art Nouveau jewelry. Uh, they wanted to use exotic materials. And um, so we get examples like this. It's actually an enameled beetle. Um, now, let's have a look at the actual metal because I don't think that it's actually gold. I think it's actually a material called pinchbeck. 
which was a material developed by a gentleman called Charles Pinchbeck in 1732. But he found that by alloying copper and zinc, he could come up with a gold-like substance. And so it was used a lot in Victorian times, and it was used a lot in Art Nouveau as well, because again, they weren't so much interested in the value. They wanted to come out with new and interesting things. Uh, Value-wise, um, they're very desirable. I mean, people, people love insects, jewelry, and everything else. I think at an auction in the, in the right place, you could be looking at $150 to $200. I think it could be even higher than that if you got the right buyers. Well, I have to say that I'm very surprised to see this uh, painting by Maude Lewis, his, who was one of Canada's foremost folk art painters, and of course uh, from Nova Scotia. I'm really surprised to see it here. How did you come by it? Well, I saw the lady on our television at home. Right. And I said, if we ever take a trip to Digby, Nova Scotia, yeah. I'm going to find that lady. Right. And I found the lady and yes. visited her at her home in September of 1960. And this is this is where you saw her? Yes, I visited that home. Yeah, and that and that's her home? That's her original home. Did she have this in her stock or...? Yes, it was wet. And I asked her if I could buy a painting that I saw her work on TV. Yes. And she said, I have one and it's wet. Just put it up in the back of your car, it'll dry. Right. Two things about Maude Lewis that we all have to be very careful of. She has been copied, but what you've got are the, the main and most important component of establishing whether a Maude Lewis is right or whether it's not right. And the story you tell about stopping at her house. Yes, I did. Um, and the story about her telling you to take the wet painting yes, she did. and put it up in the back yes. is a story that we really like to hear yes. because we hear that fairly often. And people would stop and they would buy paintings that were wet. And in fact, sometimes in her paintings that were wet, there were even thumbprints from them being handled. Oh, yes. Other things that we look for is she liked to outline. And you see this pencil mark yes, here? Yes, I do. She liked to outline, and there's another one here, yes. and we can see them in the sleighs here. Yes, yes. That was one of the ways she would trace the paintings out, yes. and then she would paint them. You remember what you paid for it? Yes, I do. Ten dollars. You paid ten dollars. Yes. I would say, at a, you know, at an auction, it would be, you know, forty-five hundred to fifty hundred, fifty-five hundred, yes. possibly as much as six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Thank you yeah. very much. piece of campaign furniture what makes these extremely special is the fact that they are the they are campaign furniture that can be knocked down if we take a look here we can see the bolts that go through the chairs the chair does come apart by taking the bolts out I looked at these and I thought 1830s 1840s yes um, having to take up the seat in here and uh, of course what jumped out at me straight away was this the 24th regiment the 24th regiment of foot um, was was stationed here in kingston yes how did you come by them well it's an interesting story because where i live i had seen a house that i very much admired and i went to look at it when it became for sale and the chairs were inside the house. So these chairs then became available at auction about a year later, and I had remembered them. The fact that they broke down and the entire, uh, and there are five of them as a matter of fact, so I have another one at home. The 24th Regiment was actually in Kingston in 1835 to 80, 1837 to quell the rebellion of 1837. Of course, of course the 1837 rebellion, And yes. then they, they, I think it said they removed, I found this information in, uh, in a book about the 24th Regiment, and they came from Montreal, and it said they were moved in 1837 to Toronto. May I ask how much you paid for them? Approximately $100 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, chairs like this, 
on the open market should should catch between between a thousand and twelve hundred each. A little more perhaps between twelve to fifteen hundred a piece. Yes. And as you have a set as you have a set of five, yes, definitely in the twelve to fifteen hundred set. So these are a handsome pair of decanters. So where did you get these? Uh, I got those uh, roughly 30 years ago uh, in a little town outside of Toronto, uh, Uxbridge or Stouffville, I'm not sure, but it was in that area. I don't know if they're for wine or for uh, brandy. They're for, the, they're, for, they're for the hard stuff. The hard stuff. Yeah, they are, they're for the hard stuff. And they're ideally suited. They're great. They're in good condition. Um, the, uh, the sort of silver is, is, is not exposed to the alcohol uh, at all, so they're glass really and just sort of mounted on the outside of the silver, so you're not going <laughs> to do your liquor any harm. Right. And uh, I don't think there's any danger of any leaching of lead or anything like that. Right. They are glass, they're not crystal. Yeah. And, and they're engraved glass. They're, they're probably Dutch. The silver mounts, though, are in, they're marked on the bottom. I don't know if you've seen the marks on the base. Well, those, they're German silver marks. They're German after 1880. And uh, so stylistically, this type of, of uh, decorative decanter are typical of sort of the period 1900 through to about 1920. What did you pay for them 30 years ago? Do you remember? Yes, I do remember uh, because they didn't want to sell them to me. They just freshly came in the store. Um, I paid $200 for them, Canadian, right. of course. Right. Well, that freshly didn't want to sell them to you and just came in the store. It was always a good line, you know. You hear, we hear that a lot. Well, uh, she was unpacking them at the right. time with other items, so I sort of believed the story. She had all the props then. Yeah. Well, uh, but they've done very well, I think, in the meantime. You know, they are really are a desirable thing, and just as you saw them and, and wanted them right away, that's the way a lot of people feel about them. Right. And I think a pair of decanters today at auction like that um, would bring somewhere in the uh, say twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, something, something in that order, without any trouble. Oh, it's done better than my savings account. So you just want to check out what they're made yeah. of, a little bit of the yeah. history. I know this one's from Germany, but I'm not really sure where this one's from. Yeah, I was wondering about the German eagle. They didn't look, yeah. they didn't look English. Yeah. But are they? Or you, they just brought them back as they souvenirs? They just brought them back. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it it's an be. Italian one. Yeah. It's got well, it says trademark, though, and it's in oh, English. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everybody's an expert, eh? Everybody's an expert. Oh, you can have it all appraised in line. You don't, you don't need the experts. <laughs> well, I got it as a, as a gift from my grandmother years ago. Uh, she was from Norway, and apparently her girlfriend's grandmother gave it to her. And... Um, she just passed it on, and I've just loved it ever since. Have Have you done any research? Have, have um, you... Well, on the internet, we've uh, seen similar vases, uh -huh. um, and we think it might be by the same maker. Right. And who Who is that maker? Lotz. L O T Z. Yes. Lutz uh, was a company who specialized in iridescent glass. But this iridescent work on this particular one is really just stunning. And if you look at the different greens and so forth and the way that they are reacting to the light, it shows you the really superb quality that this, that this piece has. Um, Lutz not only did large vases, but uh, more unusually small vases. And that's really where the, where the market is. If I look at the bottom, I can see that there are, are marks here. Uh, it tells me that it is a sterling silver overlay here. It really is a spectacular uh, piece. In, in your travels around, did you have any idea of how much it might be worth? No, and yet I, I wanted to keep it safe, so I carried it with me everywhere, you know, in, in my purse or in, you know, a handbag right. for sure. And, and it came uh, here in a sock? Yes, I brought it in a sock. Right. Yes. Well, if I told you that the sock in your handbag was going to be worth somewhere between um, $1,500 and $2,000. Wow. <laughs> I guess you'd put it back in the sock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> put it back in the sock. And I'll keep taking care of it. Where did you get the chair and the stool? We bought it about 30 years ago. Our cottage became redundant. And yes. We uh, decided cottage life wasn't for us anymore, so we uh, sold it. And Invested your money of, in something else. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know it's an ostomaton, yeah. so-called chair. Ostomaton is, uh, uh, the, uh, is a French term, and that's, of course, because of the shape of the stretcher in the front, which right. in English is sheep horn. This one being painted, it's, there's not a lot of wood showing that allows yeah. you to 
determine whether it's French or English, but uh, French or, uh, or Quebec. Right. Um, but when looking at it closely, it's Birch Arms, not Beach. If it were in Beach, it would be a French yes, chair. Yes. You can see the pins, double pegged, beautifully formed, shaped like this. Arms are set back on this chair. Well, this chair dates about 1740, or first half of the 18th century. Um, let's just look at the stool for a minute. Now, did you buy this at the same time? Yes. And the size is quite big. And mm -hmm. the similarity in the size to the size of the chair made me wonder if it wasn't the a chair, chair bottom. that had been cut. Yep. I did cheat a little and poke my fingers in the corners here. Okay. And it feels like the top end is beveled, which it should be if it's a stool, on both that corner and the back corner. Some nice traces of original finish on it, too. Yeah. Uh, Value-wise, what do you think? I would say this is probably in the neighborhood of, well, if you six, maybe, 6,000. Even with this 30-year-old paint and this replaced stretcher, I think you'd still be in the 18,000 to 22,000. Okay. Oh, and the stool, Austin Mouton stools are very rare. They're yes. very rare. The yeah. size of it, I find it a bit disconcerting. I'd like to take it apart and really look Maybe at we'll it. Maybe we'll do that someday. But in this, right now, I'd say easily, again, Maybe twenty-five thousand, if it's right. Really? They're rare. It's very rare. Yeah. Very rare piece. Oh, that's that's exceptionally good news. Dr. Frederick Banting, who, of course, we all know as the, as the co-creator of insulin, and he, of course, won the um, Nobel Prize for it. What some people aren't aware of is that he was equally as much of, uh, uh, an accomplished painter. How did you come to, to have this painting? Uh, my husband bought it at an auction in Peterborough about um, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it, the two there was two paintings held up by the auctioneer, and you could bid on by choice. Right. So uh, for $110, we got the Banting and a J.W. Beattie. No kidding. Yes. There's some very, very nice uh, and subtle gradations in the sky here. Pinks, yellows, mauves, and whatnot. It would clean up marvelously. Um, have you ever had it cleaned? No. No. You might want to look at having a professional clean done. It would just, it just add a, a lot of vibrancy okay. to, the, to the piece. Are there any inscriptions on the back? Yes, on the back of the painting itself, it says um, either Toban or Loban or Soban, something like that, um, Quebec 1927. Quebec 20, okay, so that would be the first trip yeah, that it? he took with Jackson okay. along the uh, St. Lawrence. In its current, the original frame, current condition, I would think now a realistic expectation at auction would be somewhere in the five to $6,000 range. A little That's bit, not bad for 110. Not, not bad at all. Well, we're making full use of Queen's University with this lovely hall, etc. But Queen's University is the only university in the country with a master's degree in art conservation. Barbara Clemson is a professor of painting conservation. So if something like this comes in, you think, okay, you analyze, what is it? Yes, we, we analyze it, we do scientific analysis as well. We take small samples from the painting and we analyze those layers to make sure that we know exactly what is happening with the work. How do you teach someone to, to fix things or look after things with, without ruining them? <laughs> be, be, be a little scary. It is a little scary at first, uh, but we teach the students step by step how to document the paintings. So they have to do a full written uh, report on the painting and they study each layer of the painting before they can actually touch it. And then after that we teach them how to clean, remove discolored varnish, and do uh, repairs on damages such as you're seeing. So how do things get damaged like this? Well, damages can be uh, introduced into a painting in a variety of, of uh, ways. I've seen darts thrown at paintings, at cottages, for example. 
uh, tennis balls, uh, cats jumping into the painting and leaving marks from their claws. So I've seen just about every type of damage on a painting. But you have to rep end that up we repairing. Can, and we can repair. A lot of people think that their paintings are beyond repair, but uh, we have the methods and the technology and we can do the scientific analysis to make sure that the painting can be restored and thus increased in value. Now, a lot of people say that they learn from watching the Canadian Antiques Roadshow how to look after their objects. If you were saying, grab them by the shoulders and if they have paintings, which is your specialty, what are the top three things they should never do? Um, first of all, most damage is introduced when you're removing a, a work of art, if you're taking it down from the wall or you're transporting it to another residence. So be careful when you touch your painting, remove it. Um, be careful about the environment that's in, try to keep the humidity stable, and don't put those lights on top of the really? paintings. It creates a, a hot spot on the painting and it can damage your painting. So many people put lights on yes, their paintings. Yes, it would be better to have lights set on the ceiling, um, set away from the work, so that it doesn't heat up the work itself. All right. I don't have any of those lights. Oh, that's a few. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. You're very welcome. What a wonderful little object you brought in today. I'm really excited to see it. Did you find it locally? Yes, I did. And do you know anything about it at all? No, I don't. This is part of the reason I'm here. I've tried to find out about it, I've had people look at it, and I have no idea the age or what it might be worth. I was hoping maybe you could tell me. I, maybe I can. Um, you know that it's a sewing kit. Yes. And you know that it's gold. Okay. You were aware of that? Uh, I think 18 karat or, Eight, or better. It's 18 karat, it's all hallmarked, and that's only part of its value. The case is not as valuable, but close to. It's going to add a lot of value to the item. The case is shagreen, which is shark skin, and it's in remarkably good condition. The exterior of that case is clean. On the top, on the bottom, where it would have been slid across tables and dressers, uh, might have been carried in a bag, it said virtually no wear. No. The hinge is in excellent condition. The interior, beautiful. Original label from Paris. It dates from the 1920s. Um, if the box had nothing in it, you'd still have a significant item. Oh. With the items, I think you're going to be very pleased. Where did you acquire it? At a yard sale. At a yard sale. Okay. Do you mind if I ask you what you paid for it? Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Um, that was about 12 or 15 years ago. It's appreciated significantly. Even probably the hour after you bought it was worth more than you paid. Um, in today's marketplace, comfortably, we could sell this tomorrow for between 1800 and 2400 Very good. I thought you might like that. Yes. <laughs> I've got a signaling telescope from the first war. It's, uh, I'm, I'm able to confirm that because it's dated and stamped, 1916, 16. made by Dolmeyer of London. Bought it in the antique shop. How much? I paid about 200 for it. This is one of the few shows in the world you can just keep going up to people saying, oh, how much, how much, <laughs> without looking incredibly rude. Yeah. How much? Uh, 200. 200. Yep. So that's cool. Yeah. Maybe the military guy will enjoy that. It's a, uh, a sampler map that comes from Fairfield House, which is a museum just west of Kingston. The house was built by William Fairfield in 1793. Uh, the house has remained in the same, gener same family for six generations. Uh, we, we therefore know this was part of their collection. Mm -hmm. uh, in many ways, it's a, a very significant uh, loyalist artifact yeah. in the area. Yes, well, it's a great artifact. It's a silk, it's on silk with silk thread work. Uh, beautiful detail. You start to look at the, the different uh, geographic locations, the, the, the different colors on it, some interesting names. You've got the frigid region up here, yeah. which is kind of amusing. It's like something out of Star Wars. <laughs> and down into the lower area, um, when you start in the east, you have much more detail, and as you work west, there's less and less detail, which is, again, is indicative of the time period. Um, I did consult with our uh, cartographer expert, and we're a little uncomfortable with saying it's from the 1790 period for two reasons. Cuba became a country, he thinks, in about 1805, and over here in California, if this were a 1790 map, it wouldn't say California. This whole region, would say St. Albion. So again, 
um, from, a, from a cartography expert, he's saying it's probably 1810 to 1815. The condition is an issue, um, and you being connected with the museum, I'm sure you have some conservation uh, experts to consult on it. Uh, we've, uh, we've now stored this off-site so that it's in a controlled environment. For a number of years, of course, it was in the house. Yes. Uh, we are also in the process of contacting the Canadian Conservation Institute and looking at stabilizing it so there's mm -hmm. no further deterioration, mm -hmm. um, so it's protected for, for the future. It should, be, oh, it'd be, it should be on display. It's a wonderful, wonderful object. And value-wise, it's, again, we, it's kind of a crossover piece because we, as a map, there are maps like this done on silk in sampler form. Um, being all of North America, it's a bit different, it's a bit more special. Um, from a map point of view, the value would be around $5,000. But from a folk art point of view, I see this could push up to $7,500 in a restored condition. My $35 clock is worth $450, and my £2.10 cameo is worth $140, he said, because of the, they're in style, then they're not in style. But so. people come out as if someone handed them the cash. Oh, I don't it's care. Just a, it's just the concept. lovely. It's, it's just, just lovely to know that what I bought when I was 15 is worth all that money now. Was it interesting to find out? Oh, wonderful. Really wonderful. My clock was German, which, how would I know? It was just fabulous. Being in King's has been really exciting because earlier I saw a wonderful pair of Montreal card tables. And you've just brought in a Montreal tea table. And the difference is the table is all wood inside and a card table has a baize or a leather interior. Oh, okay. And we know that it's Montreal because just like the other ones it has pine, nice clear pine, a little bit of uh, birch. Um, the other tables had oak here, but this one's um, birch, uh, ash, I mean, the support here. Mm -hmm. And it has the same black line inlay along the skirt, and this box inlay here is ebonized as well. It's a wonderful table, and this table is a little nicer because it still has a lot of the richness of the wood showing through. It hasn't been refinished. No. But I do notice that you've got a bit of damage here. What was that from? Did you do that? I think many, many moons ago before we had the table that there was a plant or something left on it. It looks like it, doesn't it? It looks like the finish is sort of eaten away, but have you waxed over it or varnished over it? No, I haven't, we haven't done anything oh. to this at all. What did you have it insured for? Actually, we don't. It's with the regular... Household insurance? Yeah. Common thing. A table like this, in this condition, it's very, very nice. You're looking at about a value of about seven thousand dollars. Oh wow, really? So get it insured. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. The estate only had it at twenty-two hundred, I think, at the time. So when you bought it, you just bought it, not knowing that it had this history attached to it. Yes. So when you finally opened the back and found out who it yeah. had been presented to and, yeah. and what for for winning the Boston Marathon, yeah, what year again? Nineteen ten. Nineteen ten. Yeah, and that's this photo there crossing the finish line. Where'd you get the photo? Uh, I I got it off the internet. The photo. Yeah. Once you learned the story. Yeah, once I learned, yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. great. There's one living artist today more than any other Canadian who is recognized internationally, and that's Alex Colbert. You were kind enough to bring in today a serograph of his, a very early serograph, I might add, entitled High Diver. Can you tell me, how did you come to own such an unusual print? I actually bought it from Colville himself. You got it from personally? From him personally, because he was my professor at Mount Allison University. Really? Yes. You, so you studied art yourself? No, I studied art history. Art history, so right. This, as I say, it's entitled High Diver. It's from 1957, very, very early on, one of his earlier um, serographs. It appears to be in good condition, but I'm curious about this right here. Do you know? Well, we had to move very frequently, and the movers were not careful, mm. but I hope to have that taken care of. But it's still, it's, I went through auction records, sale records, and 
going back about 20 years, I can't find any record of this particular print having been on the market. There were only 20 in the edition, so it's a very low edition. And you often find this case, and in the case of artists like Colville, people know what they've got. And they just, they tend to hold on to it. It's not a, a, a very common one to the market. It's very rare to the market, actually. It has all the typical qualities, the, the, the very sort of stylized realism, which sort of sounds contradictory, but, um, but it's not. You can see its, its style has evolved since, you know, in the, in the ensuing 50 or 45 years, but you can certainly see where it started. If this were to come out on the market today, forgetting for a moment the, the, the condition issue, I would think it would have to be a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar print. Thank you. And you'll enjoy it a whole lot more. I love it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for bringing it in. Okay, we have a Waltham pocket watch here, but there's some special significance to it. Yes, actually, uh, it's uh, a pocket watch that was uh, presented to Fred Cameron. Uh, for winning the Boston Marathon, in, uh, and he won that in 1910. And Fred was from where? Uh, Amherst, Nova Scotia. All right, so we have a local boy winning. Yes. Yeah. How many Boston Marathons was there? Um, from my research, there was, uh, uh, I'm not sure how many there were, but the first one was in 1897. Mm. Okay, this is a, uh, a, a Waltham Crescent Street, which is a high-grade pocket watch, mm -hmm. but uh, the, uh, the real significance, of course, comes from the fact that it's engraved in the back showing that he did indeed win the Boston Marathon. And if we look inside, we see that this is probably one of the best pocket watches that, uh, that Waltham made. Very high quality gold center wheel, gold jewels. And overall, it's just an absolutely fantastic condition. Even comes with its original uh, jewelers from uh, Amherst, uh, Nova Scotia. Yeah. So how did you acquire the watch? Um, well, actually, it was my uncle that acquired it um, at an auction. Um, it was, uh, there was three pocket watches uh, up uh, at once for the auction. Okay. And, uh, uh, it went at a certain price, and you could pick your, your, you know, one of the three. And the one that he picked was this one. Um, he couldn't get it open, but he had, he, he, he just liked it because, you know, it was gold. It was the only gold one, and he figured it was probably the best of the three. Um, and then, to his surprise, later when he managed to get it open, uh, he knew he made a good choice. He certainly did. And how much did he pay for it? Uh, One hundred and twenty-five dollars. One hundred twenty-five dollars. Well, he's he's uh, got a good investment here because today we've got a thousand dollars for the watch by itself. Yes. The way it is, um, with all the history that goes behind it, you know, it's really hard to say. But uh, yes. but I'm sure that somebody who was interested in the Boston Marathon memorabilia would uh, would very likely pay double for that. This is just a phenomenal collection of movie, sports, uh, autographs, and and folders and programs that, that I've seen on the roadshow. This Frank Sinatra one just blew me away. Yes. Uh, to see a young picture of Sinatra like young. that. And then on the back of it, there's Frank Sinatra's signature. And that's a very, very good signature. Uh, and, and there are just so many more of them. How did you come in contact with this wonderful collection? Well, a friend of mine had these, he's met all these people personally and uh, acquired their autographs going to different shows and he's traveled abroad and they were all in a basement in a locker uh, in a box. So I gathered them all up together and decided to put a collection together and to take better care of them and bring them here. Uh, I just picked out a few pieces. Starting over here, this was Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis again at the Copacabana. And every one of these have their signatures on them. Yes. And there's Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis on the back of the uh, folder. Uh, as we go around, Lucille Ball, there's the actual program. And then there is the picture of Lucille Ball with her signature. She looks beautiful there. Yeah, yes, she certainly does. And then there's the great Duke Ellington with the Duke Ellington band. This one I found interesting because uh, it was uh, when he went traveled to Holland. Yes. And that's when my friend had gone to Holland uh, to escape the Holocaust in Germany. So, so your friend was from Germany. Yes. And, he was and from eventually Germany. emigrated to Canada. Yes. And then finally, one of the funny men of our century, uh, Bob Hope. What a, a great comedian he yeah. was. And uh, I think you told me there were about 150 pieces in the collection? Yes, there are some that I'm not sure, I can't read the autographs, but the ones I have uh, cataloged and logged in the books, there's 158, I think. Yeah. But I would think that uh, just 
off the top of my head and, and looking at what I've seen, uh, you're looking at a value of somewhere between five to seventy-five hundred dollars in, in value, and maybe more. Right. Okay. Thank That's you for wonderful. bringing them in. Thank you very much. of work from the 1700s 1750s 1800 i understand wow did the mechanisms work or i don't know i haven't tried them. you haven't fired it off no. No. <laughs> so that's ottoman empire stuff yes very yeah. cool this isn't the prettiest doll i've ever seen what do you know about it well in the 1950s the dupont corporation created nancy nylon to promote the use of nylon fabrics in uh, canada and around the world um, she was retired in 1982 uh, from full service after traveling the entire world, and uh, she's, she's been to many functions. So it was made to promote the fabric? Uh, it was made to promote the, the individual nylon fibers and the joys and the benefits of having nylon. So, so all of this stuff was made here, um, they, like these fabrics were yeah, made here Yeah, the fabrics in, were, all in in, were all local to Kingston, um, and then she's been traveling ever since. And then this is her on the, the fronts of the... Yeah, the, uh, this, she originally had a column in the Toronto newspaper as well as Montreal, and she also had all these little how-to books that show you the, the ease of use with nylon and the benefits of nylon. She also graced a newsletter, for, there was a trade newsletter saying why you should invest in nylon. Now, all of these drawers are full? All of the drawers are full. They contain different types of uh, clothing and and uh, accessories that she can be outfitted Pajamas, with. Pajamas, undergarments. Pajamas, undergarments, dress clothes, um, ski wear. There's, uh, there's just a phenomenal amount of stuff in How it. How did you come to about owning her? Well, in uh, 1982, DuPont Corporation here in Kingston held their 40th anniversary, and they decided to retire her. Um, no one wanted her, from what I can remember, and uh, my grandmother had, said, had really enjoyed it and said, I I'd like to take her home. So uh, that's how we pretty much end up. And then my mother was... Uh, was then given it from my grandmother, and she's been in our possession ever since. She's composition. Okay. She was probably made specifically for this. They wouldn't sell this as a doll. No. Um, any idea what she's worth? None whatsoever. I mean, I, we feel she's one of a kind, so she's worth a lot to us because all of our family's been in DuPont for years, and yeah. now they're not in existence anymore. It's been sold to another company, so. Putting a value on this is really, really difficult because it is one of a kind. Yeah. Advertising figures you know, characters, animals, people that were used in advertising campaigns are very, very collectible. It's one of the new things yeah. in advertising. Yeah. I would think that if you saw this come up in a well-publicized auction, it's a wide range, but I wouldn't be surprised if this brought somewhere between $2,000 and $5,000. Really? And it just sort of depends on the day and, and how much you grab somebody. In 1860, the Prince of Wales was here. Yeah. You were not here in 1860. Yeah. He obviously didn't give them to you. So how did you get them? Well, I found two down in Maine right. in an antique shop. I had one on the dining room table when I came back with sauce in it. And my American friend, who was a guest, said to me, Oh, my dear, I think I know where there's more of that down in the States. I put in motion to find the rest. And my mother gave it to me as a Christmas present. So how many do you have now? I have 14. 14? 14, and I think, uh, I think there was one broken, so that was 15 originally. Right. And I must say, I, I don't keep them in a glass case, but I do use them. Oh, I'm glad to you use them. Now, do you know, have any, how do you get them insured? Look, for how much? I haven't insured them. All right, because of their connection to Canada and the Prince of Wales, and they're beautiful, and you've got lots of them. So let's think of about 5,000 to 6,000 for the lot. Uh, this is a painting done by Robert Bateman. He's a Canadian artist, and it was painted when he was 15 years old. Come on, 1945. Yeah, and it was painted for his grandmother on the back. It, it, uh, and oh, is that ever great? 
Oh, look at that. Isn't that sweet? Happy birthday, Granny. February 18, 1945, Bob. Robert Bateman, and he signed it again, obviously, in 83, yeah. sort of acknowledging and that he... And it was bought at an auction sale for $8. Come on. Yep. <laughs> it was one of his early practicing on birds. That's great. What a nice story. And you bought me what's one of the nicest uh, Regency chairs that I've seen. Certainly okay. all day, maybe on tour. It has these beautiful scroll arms to it, but there's one thing wrong. What's that? It's tiny. Yeah. Well, it's okay. a high chair, yep. made in two pieces, for it, what must have been a very well-off family. Mm -hmm. Have you any idea who the pampered child was that sat in this chair? <laughs> well, it was supposed to come into my mother's family through a marriage about 1837. Okay. Uh, they thought that the other family owned it for 30 or 40 years before then, but really don't have any idea I think idea that's at this probably point. stretching it a yeah. bit far. Uh, Queen Victoria hit the throne in uh, 1837, okay. so it, it, this was a little bit before Victoria's time. It's still very elegant. It hasn't exploded into the, the full growth of Victorian furniture. Mm. This is made in England, so okay. it would have been exported to, to Canada at that period. So it was probably ordered from across the ocean. Mm. Um, what's so nice about these high chairs is not just that they're very elegant, uh, but they were very practical. And I'm just going to explain how this comes apart. As the child grew, they were entrusted a little more on their own, right. and they could have a little table to go in front of the chair. Uh, bolted together, in this case, with this wonderful looking hand-wrought uh, nut here with little, uh, little wings on it. You can see how the wing nut got its name. Right. Yeah. Beautiful piece, that's original. Yep. The chair is all original. It's a really nice piece. Oh, now tell me, did you sit in this as a child? About 40 years ago. Yes. yes. Uh, and did you survive? I survived. You didn't fall out? No. Nope. If this was a Regency chair of the period, you'd have to pay probably two or three thousand dollars to buy it. Smaller version like this, I would say probably a little bit more, two and a half, three and a half thousand dollars. So we have a harp, an yeah. African harp. It's known as the bow harp, uh, as opposed to angle harps, and it's from Africa, turn of the last century. How did you acquire it? Well, my old neighbor, Mr. Gross, next door, his friend brought it back from Africa, supposedly. I don't know where in Africa. Mr. Gross collected instruments, and he played all kinds of instruments. And his friend brought this back as a gift for him. And when he got ill and decided he wanted to sell up his home, and this was sitting on the piano, and he gave it to me as a present for helping him. Well, like all harps, uh, they originated from ancient Persian culture and filtered into Africa's musical tradition through, uh, uh, through Ethiopia. And this would have been probably from the Con Congo or possibly uh, Congo, Belize. It's well made and uh, certainly has, uh, has historical value. The little branch buds that oh, he uh, made those. from hard, hardwood to, uh, to tune and they work perfectly. I mean, yes. they just... Uh, the body is hardwood, but it is, uh, uh, it is uh, linked together by two pieces of very stout leather. This is what acts as a resonating chamber. Oh, I see, okay. Because of its originality, uh, something like this in an auction, at least $2,000, probably more. You gotta be kidding. Holy mackerel. Perhaps not surprisingly, in the first capital of the United Province of Canada, we were overwhelmed with Canadiana today. Great stuff. Regimental campaign chairs from the Rebellion of 1837. Athenian medal, a beautiful silver punch bowl from the Queen's Athletic Society worth something like $30,000. Eau de Mouton chairs from Quebec, extremely valuable. A lot of paintings, A.Y. Jackson, Maud Lewis. A lovely little drawing Robert Bateman did of a bird when he was 15 for his grandmother. Who says Canada is too young to have antiques? Shame on you. Goodbye from Kingston.